I think this is it. Okay, you can move right here. Everything right you need? I think so. Let me okay. just check. Let me just... Oh, well, I'll get your belly button. That's better. Okay. Then you have to move when you need a little bit. So that's all. You know, there's a lot of neat things you get to do as a pastor. But I think probably marriages and baptisms are the two most exciting things. Too often I think church is like funerals, you know. People can't wait to get out. And there's been too many celebrations where people are looking for the body, you know. And really what we're looking for is evidence of new life and change. And probably nothing more than the marriage of a couple or the birth and baptism of a child say more about new life and hope and love and faith. And so we're gathered here to uh, celebrate the faith and the love and the new life for Chris and for Kathy. And it's kind of neat, especially with you guys out there. It's kind of wonderful for you to be able to see this. I wonder what it would be like to be at my parents' wedding. I don't know whether I'd be able to sit still. Maybe even now I couldn't sit still. But this is something you guys will always remember. And someday, by God's grace, you'll be fortunate enough to find somebody, if you're like Kathy, just like Chris. And you guys, if you're lucky to find somebody like Kathy, you'll be really blessed. There's a story in the Bible that talks about, uh, about a wedding one day that happened a long time ago, about 20 centuries ago, in a little place called Cana, which is about seven miles or so from a place where Jesus lived. And Jesus and his uh, mother and, and some of his early disciples were there. You know, as a preacher, a lot of times I don't feel like I'm very welcome at a party. You know, people think preachers are wet blankets. Quite frankly, most of us are. But I don't like to think of myself as a wet blanket. I'm not likely to run on your party with a lampshade on my head. But I will come and I will celebrate. And I will share in the joy. And I don't think I'll, I'll take too much away from it. And Jesus was the kind of person that people really loved having, having him around. And they didn't know that day when they invited him that they would have a, a very sticky situation. Not a major crisis. Not an ultimate disaster. But something that made them feel a little more than comfortable. Uh, sort of threatened to take away some of the sunshine from the day of this wedding of their friends. Uh, I don't like it. They might run out of wine. Which is no big deal. Not to us, but to them. It's a very, very big thing. And this is so important for John that he made it the very first miracle that he put in his gospel. It was the story of the changing the water into wine. And it proves a couple things. As we said earlier today, it proves that if it's important to you, it's important to God. Now, as, as a parent, you probably understand that no matter how small it seems to the rest of the world, if your child has a concern, then it's a concern for you. And if they have the joy, if they paint a picture and the, and the feet are coming out the head and the nose is down here and the face is all green and they think it's terrific, you think it's terrific too. It doesn't matter what the rest of the world thinks. If it's important to your child, it's important to you. And so in those days, of course, the wedding feast would last days, often weeks. And much to the chagrin of us today, the bride and groom may not see each other for days, even weeks. But always the symbol for the nation of Israel, always a sign of God's blessing was that the harvest was fertile, it was rich, and it was full, and particularly the grape harvest. And of course, they preserved the grapes and changed it into wine in a normal kind of fashion. And it was kept because a lot of times there was nothing else fit to drink. Water was scarce, sometimes polluted. But the wine could last and last. And of course, like today, there's different qualities of wine. And so for the Jewish couple beginning a new life together, 
the, the presence of an abundance of high quality wine was a sure sign of God's blessedness. It sounds like kind of superstition to us. And I guess it really wouldn't mean much so long as you had a bunch, but if you ran into a jam like this couple did, and for whatever reason, they ran out. And it was Mary who first noticed maybe the whisperings of the servants and the, the embarrassment of the bridegroom and the anxiousness of the wine steward who was supposed to take care of all this. And she sort of noticed Jesus and she said, hey, they're, they're out of wine. And he said something that sounds kind of rude, like, woman, what is that to me? But he actually was saying, uh, it's not my time yet. But she didn't pay much attention. And mothers don't pay much attention to their sons if they know them. They know that no matter what they say, they're going to do what's best and what's right. If they're a good son, and certainly Jesus was a, a good son. And so she just said to the servants, don't pay attention to what he says, just do whatever he tells you. And so they went and got these huge stone jars, and they were used for washing people's hands and feet and cleansing them of the debris that was in the street. And it was also used as a symbol of welcoming. And over the weeks, probably this... This water got kind of nasty, or maybe it got so nasty they dumped it out and the jars were empty. But anyway, the servants did exactly as Jesus said. And it's important. If Jesus tells you to do something, do that. Because he never has you do anything that's going to amount to nothing. It's always going to be something special and important for you. So these guys carried these things, filled them with water, just as he said, and they took them to the steward of the feast. And he put in a dipper, and he put it to his lips, and he smiled as he smacked his lips and wiped off his chin. And he ran to the bridegroom and said, this is incredible. Everybody usually serves the best wine first. And when everybody's palates are dull, and they come to tell the difference between Dom Perignon and Mad Dog 2020, they bring out the cheap stuff. He said, but you've saved the best for last. Three lessons. One, Jesus cares. God the Father cares. If it's important to you, no matter what the rest of the world thinks of it, it's important to him. Secondly, when you have a need that you cannot fulfill, he will fulfill that need. Not just so there's a little bit for everybody, but so there's a plenty for everybody. After all, 180 gallons of wine can go a long way, even in our day. And the third thing to learn is that God always, always is aware. And if you'll be obedient, that He will bless. And so it is with marriage. Chris and Kathy are here because it is God's plan. The wedding sacrament says that this is holy matrimony instituted of God, which means that the vast majority of us, with very, very few exceptions, are created to spend the majority of our life united with the partner of the opposite sex. And since it is God's plan and God's purpose, God provides the opportunity. And he has brought the two of you together in kind of a mystical union. Who knows why you should, you should fall in love with Kathy? I mean, it's obvious to see there's lots of reasons and lots of lovely things about her, but certainly there are lots of lovely other people in your life. Why her and not them? And why a Christian and not somebody else? We don't know. I don't think God puts little computer cards when you're, you know, when you're born into a little computer slot where yours matches up with Chris's or Chris's matches up with yours. I don't really think it's that way, but I think God, like in all things, provides us with an opportunity. And when we take advantage of the opportunity, we are obedient. He allows things that He has begun to continue through us, through our willingness, through our faith. And so it's your love, your faith, and your hope that God brings you together. And so before Him and before your family and your friends, we celebrate the Holy Covenant, which means that God is with you whether the stuff that's small or great, whether the needs seem insignificant to the world or not. If it's important to you, it's important to Him. He will meet your needs if you ask Him. And not just enough so you guys can scrape by, but so that you can have an abundance of things. Not simply for yourselves and for your own family, but for others' families. And as you are obedient, the blessings will flow. And so we're here to celebrate that kind of covenant. And so dearly beloved, we are gathered together here in the presence of God and the sight of these witnesses, joined together this man, Christian Grow Jr., this woman, Catherine Lynn Cobb. Holy matrimony. This is an honorable estate, instituted of God and signifying unto us the mystical union which exists between Christ and His church. Which communion Christ adorned and beautified Himself with His presence in the wedding feast of King of Galilee. Is therefore not better to advisedly, but reverently, discreetly in the fear of God. Into this holy estate these two persons, Chris and Kathy, come now to be joined. And if anyone can show just cause, I mean, lawfully be joined together, 
Let them now speak or else hereafter and forever hold their peace. It's a brutal question, isn't it? To ask now at this place. I mean, at this point, we ought to be asking who's in favor of this? Who's going to support these folks? Who's going to pray for them? Who's going to encourage them? Who's going to respect the sanctity of their marriage and not stick their nose in on by them? Those are the kind of questions we ought to be answering. We ought to say, I'll pray, I care, I love, I'll support, I'll keep my nose out. And I hope that you will, because if you really want to help Chris and Kathy, and never to harm them, if you will love them unconditionally as a couple, respect the sanctity of their marriage, and if you will pray for them on a regular basis, you will do far more for them than a million dollars. Far more than a fleet of Cadillacs. Far more than a room full of furs and diamonds. Because you will bring to them the blessings of Almighty God. Kathy and Chris, I require and charge you both as you stand in the presence of God here in His house, before whom the secrets of all hearts are disclosed, and they duly consider the holy covenant you are about to make. Do now declare before this company your pledge of faith and your love for each other. Be well assured that these solemn wedding vows are kept inviolate as God's word demands. And as steadfastly you endeavor to do the will of our Heavenly Father, God will bless your marriage. He will grant you fulfillment in it, and you will establish your home in peace. Chris, would you turn and hold hands with your bride? Chris, I ask you, do you have this woman, Kathy, to be your wedded wife? To live together in the holy state of matrimony? Do you love her, comfort her, honor and keep her in sickness and in health? And forsaking all others, keep yourself only for her, so long as you both shall live. If so, would you say, Kathy, I will. Kathy, I will. Kathy, we have this man, Chris, to be your wedded husband, to live together in the holy state of matrimony. We love him, comfort him, honor and keep him in sickness and in health. Forsaking all others, keep yourself only for him, so long as you both shall live. If so, would you say, Chris, I will. Just looking at your bride to be, would you move your to me? I, Chris, I, Chris, take you, Kathy, take you, Kathy, be my wedded wife, to be my wedded wife, to have and to hold, to have and to hold, and to stay forward, and to stay forward, for better, for worse, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, to love and to cherish, till death do us part, till death do us part, according to God's holy word. According to God's holy word, I pledge you my faith. I pledge you my faith. Kathy, do you repeat after me? I, Kathy. I, Kathy. Take you, Chris. Take you, Chris. To be my wedded husband. To be my wedded husband. To have and to hold. To have and to hold. From this day forward. From this day forward. For better, for worse. For better, for worse. For richer, for poorer. For richer, for poorer. In sickness and in health. In sickness and in health. To love and to cherish. Till so death do us part. So death is part. According to God's holy word. According to God's holy word. I pledge you my faith. I pledge you my faith. We had talked earlier today about how things in the church are often so much churchies and godly gook that we don't understand. The ritual says that the wedding ring is the outward and visible sign of the inward and spiritual grace signifying unto all the uniting of this man, Chris, and this woman in holy matrimony. What it really means to say is that without some symbol of love and faith and dedication and commitment that other people can see, there would be people who certainly would like to have a woman just like Kathy occupy the same place in their life that she is now going to occupy in Chris's. And certainly a strapping young man like Chris could have women lining up who would like to have someone like him be their helpmate and their partner for the rest of life. But the ring is God's symbol, a way of, of showing the world that you're simply not available. Kathy, by wearing the ring that Chris has given her, is saying to everyone who will look and listen, I am not yours, I am first God's, and then Chris's. And Chris in the same way, where is the symbol and the sign that says, I have given my heart, my life, and my soul to God through Christ on behalf of my love and faith to Kathy, my wife. The wedding rings are always rings. 
No beginning, no end. It speaks of the unending nature of God's love. It speaks of eternity. And gold being one of the most indestructible as well as one of the most rare elements in God's creation, it symbolizes the precious nature, the indestructible nature of a marriage that truly is joined together in Christ. And so, this day, as Chris and Kathy exchange the rings and place on the symbols of love for a world to see, of commitment for a world to understand, and for joy for a world to share, and God bless these rings as they wear them. Father, we thank you for these rings and for the blessing upon them. May Christian and Kathy, as they wear them, so live in peace and love and faith together in this life, that theirs may be a life of blessedness, of fulfillment, and of peace. For this is what you promise, and this is what you shall offer, and this is what you shall deliver, as they live in faith and obedience before you for these blessings and all that are to come. We thank you in Christ's name. Chris. Chris. In token and pledge. In token and pledge. Of our constant faith. Of our constant faith. And body love. And body love. With this ring. With this ring. I be wed. I be wed. In the name of the Father. In the name of the Father. And of the Son. And of the Son. And of the Holy Spirit. For as much as Chris and Kathy have consented together in holy wedlock and have witnessed the same before God, and thus this company of friends and family, and thereto have pledged their faith each to the other and declared the same by the joining of their hands and the giving and receiving of the rings, I pronounce that they are husband and wife together, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Those whom God hath joined, let no man put asunder. Eternal God, creator and preserver of all humankind, giver of all spiritual grace and the author of everlasting life, send your blessing upon this man, Christian, and this woman, Kathy, whom we bless in your name, so that they may surely perform and keep the vow and covenant between them made, may ever remain in perfect love and peace together, and live according to your laws. Look graciously upon them that they will love and honor and cherish each other, and so live together in faithfulness and patience wisdom and true godliness, that your home may be a haven of blessing and a place of peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Christian marriage in its fullness is understood more than, than simply the joining of two people like Kathy and Chris. There's also the, the joining of their families and their friends. And I always thought that there ought to be something that we could share together that everybody could share in something particularly sacred and at the same time something particularly well known. And the ritual provides for us the solution to that thought and that is the Lord's Prayer. And so I invite you to pray aloud with us the Lord's Prayer however you've learned it as we offer ourselves and our thanksgiving before God.
Together we pray as Christ taught us, beginning with the words, Our Father who art in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread.